start with the show. So, uh, welcome to the 106th edition of Airhex TV, the very first one in 2023. So we had already fun in the chat, and today I have only a few questions. But uh, what what I did, I took a look at the uh, time travel or time machine. And uh, there are some interesting stuff going on. So either it will be very short show or very lo very long one. It really depends. Okay, this is uh, Mr. Uh, Alexander Tetarin, and he is from Texas. He attended actually the AHEX Live workshops in December. And by the way, I really enjoy, I don't know why, the December edition of AHEX is almost like a Christmas. So usually, you know, there are attendees from all over the place and they uh, sending images. Uh, this time there was no snow, but usually there's no... Um, some snow landscapes and um, and Ale Ale Alexander always asks great questions and so we discussed this already um, in uh, in the AHEX live. So the problem of Ale of Alexander is the following: um, they have their own uh, OAuth, so authorization authentication infrastructure, and Alexander has to you know refresh the token in a lambda, and he asks him you now what to do. The problem is of course if you do it in a lambda, it will cost you a little bit more. But um, if you do it outside the lambda, it will also cost you more, um, because <laughs> what uh, you know the canonical solution to your problem, Alexander, is the lambda extensions. So what lambda extensions are? This is um, a part of code which runs between your lambda and the lambda runtime. The problem is you have you know to to uh, you have the access to the to the data stream. And you can uh, and you can you know process the stream and react to it. So most of the profilers and monitoring tools are using exactly this uh, this technology. And the problem is in Java, uh, we don't have such problems because we are running so-called middleware. So if you run Quarkus or whatever, we can do whatever we like there. So it doesn't make a lot a huge difference for us if you're running Quarkus, for instance, in the Lambda, whether you know you do something before the Lambda is called in an extension or in Quarkus. If there will be no Quarkus, of course, we could then, you know, uh, implement and an, an token refresher as a Lambda extension. Um, another thing, so it really depends uh, how the Lambda is called. If the Lambda is called asynchronously, what you could do as well, you could actually use EventBridge for it. I don't know, Alexander, whether we discussed this in the AHEX Live um, workshop last time and actually forgot to look it up. So let's see whether I found it. This is event bridge HTTP uh, API, I think, is called. And um, with the event bridge HTTP API, uh, API destinations, hopefully, you can call. So if the ev event ar um, arrives in event bridge, you can actually decide that you would like to call additional external source and pull some data in it. So maybe you maybe it could work uh, in, in this particular case. And um, and uh, what uh, Alessandra suggested, uh, this is what we discussed, this is new, what I'm suggesting right now. But, um, so as a target or a rule, but um, what uh, we also discussed, this is, okay, the Lambda extension, so we discussed right now, we could use the Lambda authorizer in the gateway. What this means is, Lambda authorizer in the API gateway is just you can you can tell the HTTP API gateway, look, here is a lambda, call it before the actual lambda is called, and then you can pull your data from whatever you like. But I think this will be discussed in the workshop. There is a, um, a token refresher option, and the uh, token or refresher option uh, there is uh, you have to implement the token refresher option. And what we discuss is that we use DynamoDB as a persistent cache. And uh, and we refresh the to the tokens in the DynamoDB and Lambda just pulls it from DynamoDB. So the only problem I observe with DynamoDB API, if you use it for that for that just for that, it is quite heavy. So if you if you call DynamoDB from Lambda, it can take the first time one two seconds because it seems to me like in the DynamoDB API, a, a lot of stuff happens, like um, metadata caching or something like this. So for instance, S3 is very fast call and DynamoDB is slower. So Alexander, what you will have to do with uh, the DynamoDB client, this is what I tried, is you could you know, put the static initialization, a static block, for instance, where the Lambda is you know, pre-initialized with the DynamoDB. And maybe you, you could call you know, a fake table or whatever, 
And of course, don't forget the uh, the uh, crack or a snap start because this will also help you. So what will happen then is that your lambda is invoked the very first time by the snap and then and then uh, optimize. So th this is what you have to consider if you use DynamoDB as a cache. Okay, so this was this were you know the real question from the uh, from the entities, and then it's just just my stuff. So I would just take a look. Oh. Um, Groovevine edition. Hello from Lincoln. So Delaney is uh, a pilot who who flies now. Um, and, and, and those small airplanes. You can listen to the Airhex FM podcast. That there's even not room for an iPad. So this is like you know the the, the smallest machine. Maybe a drone even something like this. Um, okay. So uh, now this. I will write actually a blog post. So the entire <laughs> the story is funny. So what I all usually wrote is um, the um, predictions. So you know, so and um, I think the first one, the first time I managed to publish it in February or January, and then I had no time. And uh, the last year, I was very late, so I did half year predictions. And this year there was so much to do, so I had absolutely no time to do this. So I now I have you know instead of predicting something I can only observe the 2020 or uh, the year in review. What uh, my observations are that uh, companies are starting to recognize that the clouds cost money, real money, and uh, they are not necessarily cheaper they, than on-premise solutions. And also uh, I think in the clouds the entire in architecture is going to be simpler and more pragmatic. So um, what I observed in 2022, this was really very first time. If, if I know suggested something, you know, which is cheaper, uh, the company started to listen to me. Usually, so, okay, no, it's not compliant or you have no idea and we always did it this way and we have to use Kubernetes because it's cloud native. Other solutions are not cloud native. This was like no esoteric discussion. But in 2022, something started to happen, and um, and uh, and uh, we can actually deploy, you know, our serverless Quarkus architectures, which are very very similar to to the Java E stuff we discussed the entire time. And by the way, Tiago is like the oracle. Yeah, you can always ask Tiago. I think he freshly watched, you know, 66 episodes. So whatever we, we know discussed the last nine years, now we do the same as serverless Java E almost in the cloud. Okay, now um, this is my observations. Also, I don't actually didn't record anything new with web components. What I can tell you is this, it took absolutely off. So all my projects right now are web components, exactly the architecture I discuss here. Everything I, <coughs> I do right now is with uh, 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 vanilla web components and, and Redux and uh, lit HTML and, and no frameworks anymore. And this is like a natural natural way to go this is what um what uh what i um see in the wild right okay now back to the questions because they are interesting so um i think i think um oh very good question so pablo from chile hi pablo and Pablo, I think you commented on my shorts, which, uh, thank you a lot. Oh, by the way, uh, shorts, uh, forgot to mention them. I have um, a playlist on my YouTube channel called One Minute With, and I'm recording shorts. And this is pretty cool because I can actually, you know, record 40 seconds, you know, Java snippets, which uh, I just encounter in my projects, or um, if I write, you know, some utilities or whatever, I say, oh, it is actually a cool idea, and, and, and post it as a short. And they are gaining more and more momentum, and uh, you know the community is building up. And I think I passed, you know, the one hundredth short. For me, no effort, you know, to record a new one. I got nice comments, like for instance from Pablo. So thank you for watching, and uh, see what happens. So I will keep uh, pub publishing them because it's very easy to publish. So um, now, uh, Mister hard to pronounce. Hi, Adam. Why do you th don't use IntelliJ IDEA and use uh, uh, Visual Studio Code? Um, so, um, very good question. I actually have uh, the complete uh, I'm toolbox license from uh, from JetBrains, so I have all the tools from them. Um, I'm a consultant um, 
and uh, usually I work with you know with different people from different uh, companies. And uh, the reason that exactly the same was with NetBeans. So I still love NetBeans and like Net NetBeans and uh, Visual Studio Code. Similar story. If I show them, you know, Visual Studio Code, it's very easy for them to just download and replicate what they are doing. There are no plugins, nothing, you know, and this is free, completely free. So with the IntelliJ open source, uh, it is uh, doesn't ship with all the plugins. And I do a lot or a lot. I have to do some JavaScript as well. And I would say in uh, web projects, Visual Studio Code is the clear winner. I don't think, you know, there's a lot of, how to call it, uh, web native developers who not only know JavaScript, HTML, who would, you know, buy WebStorm. I think everyone uses Visual Studio Code. And also I use a mix Visual Studio Code as an editor and Visual Studio Code as an IDE. So what I what I like to do is you know to open five Visual Studio Codes with different projects, which is harder to achieve with NetBeans, IntelliJ, or Eclipse. So this is my pragmatic reasons. And I think Visual Studio Code gets more and more popular. What I can tell you is from the from handling, it's a little bit slower than NetBeans. I have I have no feeling with IntelliJ. I have to try it out. But um, NetBeans is faster than Visual Studio Code. So what I expect, I, I would expect a rewrite of Visual Studio Code in one point of time or something should happen because it's always the case that something is laggy a little, little bit and then, you know, magic happens and the entire community switches to something new. So this could happen because I think Visual Studio Code is now uh, based on Electron, which is slow. And uh, in uh, what we have in, in uh, already uh, Rust-based solutions. Yeah, uh, Pablo, yes. Uh, thank you for your comments. They, they were great. Um, so, okay, cool. So I think we clarified that. So thank you for the question. And uh, now back to time travel or back to time travel. So API destination discussed. By the way, I have a new website, uh, Airhex News. So uh, the attendees from the workshops know the architecture. So um, if you put here the email address, um, then I will get your email address. There is no other question asked. You, you should be able to unsubscribe at any time. So there is one single row in a table with your email address and I will send you updates if there is a new workshop or online workshop, which I which I uh, plan to record a new one or some conference talks. The frequency is maybe, I don't know, it was last year was like twice a year. I tried you know, to do the, 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 so if you like, you can subscribe. It's just, you know, um, why I did it actually, people ask me, okay, I didn't knew that there is a workshop. So I said, okay, then I, I create a mailing list. It's like a meta, you know, event mailing list. It's not about the technology. It's more about events, conferences, and whatever I'm doing publicly. Okay, this is done. Okay, if you are already in the announcement round, um, there are two new workshops in June, actually. I thought that I, um, in, in summer. And uh, why, the, why the workshops? What I noticed in the serverless workshop in last December that uh, maybe I should do something like AWS Java Bootstrap workshop. And um, why, I, uh, why this one? Because um, you can run Java you know, in complete different configurations or in different ways in, on, on, on AWS. I think there are more than 10 ways to run a Java container, or sorry, a Docker container or container runtime on AWS. And uh, so I will discuss, you know, from VPC design to a little bit CIDR and security groups to serverless. It's more like, you know, uh, what is the difference between running Java minus jar to container and serverless lambdas? This is my plan. And of course, I'm thinking already about, you know, the effective AWS Java because uh, this is, um, uh, this, is uh, this was, you know, the origins of the AHEX. So we had the first three workshops were um, 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 Java E Bootstrap, then Effective Java E, and I think Java E Architecture. So um, it worked. So let's try the same with the cloud. And if you ask why I'm doing AWS, is because um, now all my projects are AWS right now, but uh, Azure will come uh, to the party. And if I would talk about Azure right now, I would be confused because um, I know Azure, but the, but they are two. The similars are very similar. The services are very similar, but the names are different. So for for me, it would be hard. To uh, this, you know, to, to to always remember the right service. So this is just for pragmatic reasons. And uh, this one is this actually what I said in the observations: cost-driven architecture. So what I'm observing is architectures doesn't matter. What really matter matters right now is budget and costs. And this is actually the idea. So I will try to limit, or I will limit the uh, the seats to 25 around. This is what I always try to do. So in the uh, I think in 
winter we had uh, around 20 attendees but i completely forgot to announce it so um through my channels always on axv but not on the on the usual channels okay so if you like register should be fun and if you don't have any time just ask questions on the axv is also fine okay now okay time traveling so let's open this one because this is the origin gist from 2014 um seven years ago so and uh I, I really like the questions because we can you know learn you know back then what do you think about play framework compared to java e i often heard that java is heavyweight in development and therefore internet startups uses other framework stacks like play rails or meteor so um rails you know what it, what's races i would say not that popular but play is interesting play framework so uh, play framework is still around so this is the play framework uh so you can still download play framework this was the origin question so um we can close this one and what i was interested in what are the contributions or what happens in the play framework and as you can see this is the contribution it lo doesn't look that bad but if you take a look, you see uh, the Mr. Kurtz provides the most work and uh, the Mr. Roper, I think he was the originator of play. He stopped contributions. And the Scala steward does, you know, the also a lot of work. But then, you know, I would say in 2020, the development stopped. Now we can say, okay, uh, what's with Java E? So I was curious. And these are the contribution to Whitefly. And I would say Whitefly is also no, no more that popular. But if you take a look at on the contributions, I would say this is not a bot. Uh, this is also not a bot. And they are actually increasing, if you take a look here, right? So Stuart Douglas stopped on working on Kabi as well. Oh, a little bit here. And OK. Uh, and this is, what is this, uh, Mr. Uh, Darren? It also started you know, to contribute here. So I would say Whitefly, even Whitefly over time looks better than Play Framework. If you just take a look, you know, on the contributions. So then I was curious, like, okay, what's about something like Helidon? And Helidon looks actually really good. So there are lots of contributors and they are evenly contributing. Uh, or Captain has just, you know, uh, lots of contributions at once or so bursts. So this is now uh, Helidon. And uh, so let's take a look now on Glassfish, because Glassfish is a curious case. So the Glassfish was no, um, as you can take a look here, so the contributions are actually increasing. So this is, of course, uh, a little bit unfair, because what I know is that both uh, the the, uh, the Aryan Times and um, forgot uh, David Matei, I think da David, I forgot the last name, David Matei, um, they uh, they bound uh, they created a company around Glassfish and they are contributing now. But um, still, I mean, this is Java E. This is actually the puristic Java. If you, and if you look at the contributions, they are actually increasing and they were and they never ceased, right? So and of course uh, we can take a look at Quarkus. It's a little bit unfair because Quarkus isn't everybody's darling right now. And there are lots of contributions. And so what I would say is. That's the interesting, uh, seven years ago, you say, okay, what's about future of Java E is heavyweight? And if you take a look at the alternatives, the alternatives died and Java E still goes, you know, as, as it was, it is not a crazy popular, like Node.js, I would say, but, um, but it is, um, it, the popularity increases and doesn't decrease, which is actually great news because, uh, you know, the last seven, eight, nine years, what, uh, what I just said, you know, focus on standards, no dependencies, and the cool story is now I can pick my projects and deploy them to Quarkus or um, Micronaut on Helidon without changing any code. And uh, the runtime changes, code remains the same. Okay, I think this was interesting one. So let's see. Wow. Let's see uh, what happens here. Yeah, Tiago says, I'm very happy with NetBeans. I would say the problem right now, I spend too much time in, in, in many projects at the same time and uh, and therefore with netbeans it would be harder to achieve if i if i would work longer on one project netbeans would be great and i will keep using netbeans i like netbeans right um so um then uh she says thank for your answer what do you think about kotlin language so um 
Kotlin, for obvious reason, I mean, for obvious reason, Kotlin has to be nicer and more convenient than Java. Otherwise, it will die immediately, right? So Kotlin is everybody's darling right now. Um, and this is always my, my standard answer. Let's see whether I will um, I will find my own blog post. So Adam Bean, what language? Let's see whether I find it for sure. Uh, yeah. I get the questions about Kotlin all the time. And what I did is, in various blogs or whatever, I gathered, actually. I got to know, I remember I started with Java. People asked me why I'm not using Perl. A little bit later, later Python, then Jython, Groovy, Scala, Ruby on Rails. You, you saw already. It was also one of the questions. CoffeeScript was huge. Salon. Uh, many you know, um, people from, from Red Hat ask, is it actually around? So I'm just curious. Okay, but it seems like uh, it is moving to Eclipse Foundation, the interesting part we should to look, you know, how it's doing. But um, I got lots of questions back then, why I'm not using Salon, for instance. Dart, but Dart is great, actually, I would say. I like Dart, and uh, uh, Dart is still alive with um, the web frame and the UI framework, I forgot, actually. Uh, I will tell you, I forgot what the name then TypeScript, um, yeah, TypeScript is an interesting case. We don't have to time to in, to, to to discuss. Uh, and then now Kotlin. And the interesting part is, as you probably know, Google and Oracle are not the, the best friends, right? And um, and Kotlin is huge for in Android development. The question is, what happens when uh, you know the um, uh, when when uh, Google says now we are doing um, we are only doing uh, let's say uh, Rust. Or our own, you know, uh, operating system, which are working uh, for Android a long time. So the question is, uh, this is like just the observation. Maybe you know, Cotton will take off and take everything. But um, as you maybe take a look at the shorts, I would say more than Java 17 and 19 is just great. And I, I cannot imagine that you know, Kot with Kotlin, I would be more productive. So what small features are missing, like destructuring, what I miss, we use JavaScript, which is really nice because I can just, you know, natively destructure JSON object. It's not available in Java, but they are working on it. But uh, it's not like I would say, okay, now I have to spend, you know, three hours destructuring my Java class. It's more like, so, okay, fine. Now it's no, just call JSON object dot get string. It's not as nice, but it's working. So um, from pragmatic reasons, I would say it is not a huge problem with for me, not using Kotlin. And all my projects right now are Java 17 and Java 19. Yeah, and the next thing which I don't like about uh, Kotlin is if you take a look on the Maven project, you have additional dependency, and this is the Kotlin dependency, and this already caused up some minor issues in projects. So you have, uh, because Kotlin runs on JVM, so you have two things, and the last one, so it's repetition from my, from my. Uh, I think I already, um, we had the discussion about Kotlin, uh, and the last one is, you know, the Java evolves fast and Kotlin will have to, to keep up. So we get, you know, the project Loom with many, uh, with you know, millions of threads and so forth. And, and Kotlin will have built on JVM. The question is whether Kotlin can actually use, actually use the internal Java optimizations. This is, would be interesting to watch. So I'm not using Kotlin now, right now. And, and the reasons are more pragmatic. Uh, I still enjoy, you know, my free time. I stick with Java. I don't have to relearn everything every two years. And I, you know, save lots of time ignoring all the languages here on the page, and um, Java is still fine. So, uh, and and in, in 2022 was, you know, one of the craziest year, years ever for me. I had, you know, um, the uh, to um, cancel or cancel or, or said no to to many inquiries in my projects, and, and and Java was highly requested. I would say, and my observation is always, it, it was the same in 2008 um, that uh, if the you know the um, Economy is not doing that well. People remember about you know the old standard somehow. This is they, they have there's less room for experimentations. And if you know show them something which works you know for twenty years, they are just happy. This was maybe it's, this is my observation. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Uh, so uh, DLR uh, High Five says. What areas to cover if someone would like to learn the basic about authentication and authorization? Generally, no Jakarta is specific. Very easy answer. Uh, take a look and open ID Connect and OAuth. 
you're done. Because whatever I know is based on OAuth. Uh, uh, Kafka recently released support for OpenID Connect and OAuth. Um, and it means you need to you know, just learn. I would start, you know, start, you know the, to learn about the difference about uh, access token and ID token. So this is what I would start with. And then OAuth and then uh, OpenID Connect. And maybe you can also take a look and, for instance, Kiklo, Cognito, or something like this, right? Uh, okay. Uh, uh, by the way, I really like the, this is uh, this this format. The problem is if you ask me no ad hoc questions in chat, maybe I don't know the answer. Uh, I, can, I have no time to prepare. But let's see the next one. Uh, my personal IntelliJ killer feature is complete statement, huge time saver. Uh, I think command dot is similar to to this. And uh, what you can uh, do, it works well. We have Code Whisperer from AWS. I don't even know whether it is public already. So I was a beta tester. And uh, what you also have is um, Copilot. So it not suggests you know the next co command. It suggests you the three lines. And it is funny to watch. It is not perfect in most cases. Um, but it, it is for, you know, for for boilerplate code, sometimes you can save a line, I would say, right? So, um, um, so um, yeah. What do you ask me? What do you think about NeoVim plus plugins like IDE? Um, yeah, if you ask me such questions, I'm not trying to optimize my IDE to be hyperproductive. I try to optimize my IDE for minimalism. So my way is try to avoid plugins so that if I get another developer machine, I'm already productive. So therefore, uh, if you ask me now, uh, would you like to use this plugin? My answer would be no, if it doesn't come per default. This is also the case why I didn't use Eclipse a lot because Eclipse for me was unusable without installing 500 plugins and, and just exaggerating. And um, and NetBeans shipped with everything and I really like NetBeans and Visual Studio Code is somehow similar. So I even recorded a short how to make uh, Visual Studio Code uh, Quarkus or, or, or Java uh, capable. Very good. Next one. Uh, and what do you think about Rust language? I think Rust is the only interesting language right now because you can uh, cross-compile to Wasm. It has some interesting type safety features. But I would say for most business projects, is is not as productive as Java. But uh, it's really interesting. And uh, I would say if you, if you have time, learn Rust. It comes with interesting concepts. For instance, I would, I would prefer to learn Rust over Go, right? And oh, uh, another criticism to Kotlin. I'm absolutely not interested to learn another language which runs on on virtual machine or JVM. Sorry, on Java virtual machine. Why not? Because if I you know, already invest something, then I would learn a completely different language like Rust or uh, or or Swift, for instance, which I also like. And uh, because it's just completely different, and I have completely different opportunities. I already know what you know JVM is capable of, and I don't think you know that I would be more capable or more faster coding Java 19 than Kotlin. But I think with Rust or Swift, I could achieve complete different, or I can implement complete different use cases, which are not as easy as with Java. For instance, native integration, you no know, encryption, or uh, operating system access driver, or whatever. I can I, I can build stuff which are harder to build with Java. So. Um, Interesting one. So if you have time, invest in Rust is interesting. But uh, from business perspective, for, for me, I don't see in my projects any, any how to call it, any any advantages learning or learning Rust. OK. Uh, yeah, uh, Luis Daniel, this is uh, ask me. I have seen telling uh, people telling me to learn Go language for Kubernetes. I would say they're shifting right now. More, more and more stuff is implemented in Rust, in, also in Kubernetes. And I would say Kubernetes is not as, I would, how to call it, not as popular as it was a few years ago, I would say. Uh, and for me, Kubernetes is not cloud native. It is like, you know, a way to, uh, to, to move your, how to call it, ju just, you know, to, to, for lift and shift. Okay, this is this. Uh, Tiago asked me, Adam, Quarkus has an embedded server. If yes, is the build cycle not heavy? Heavy is called size. Um, I don't know what you mean by embedded server. How Quarkus works, uh, <laughs> works works is 
it creates an executable jar. Everything is inside, and you run the jar, and you start start Quarkus with the with the application logic. Heavyweight, um, uh, Alexander Sparkovsky, this is S, he said that Quarkus is faster than Micronode, so I would say it's the fastest possible server on the market right now then. I didn't did the measure. But um, heavy size, uh, I mean, the jar size in Quarkus um, for a Lambda in current project, I think is 25 max everything. Uh, this is everything, but it really depends which plugins are using. But the jar size is not an issue for startup. Memory size wise is Quarkus uh, smaller than Tomcat, for instance. So to go to my YouTube channel, I even recorded, I think, the comparison. Okay, Alex asked a question. So this is your, hey, you're on fire, the chat, right? So um, how how you navigate an object graph with null checking? What's your equivalent for... Uh, this is what I don't understand, this one. But um, how do you navigate an object graph with null checking? This is a good one, because I had to navigate um, a JSON a lot recently, and this is really painful because you have to say get object, get object null. But for instance, is a solution you can use JSON pointers and the problem is solved. If you use um, Java object graph, then you can rely on optional. So this is, I'm not traversing the graph. Uh, what I do often is um, if a method returns optional, I don't say optional.get. What I do is optional map filter, whatever. So this is, and this is then perfect. So you don't have, you know, because if the optional is null, nothing happens. If optional is not null, something happens. So this is my way of working and this works very good. Uh, what's uh, temp for Procras uh, says, what's your experience with jobs at dev companies or coding jobs in general? So this is, I don't know because I'm a freelancer, I'm a consultant, and uh, I get, you know, random requests. I, I don't have a Facebook page, nothing. People just come, I know, you know my clients for a long time, and uh, really what happens is every 10, year, 10 years, a client, you know, remembers, hey, I know Adam, maybe we should ping him. And, uh, and uh, they ping me and ask whether I can help them, and then I don't hear about the client for the next 10 years. So this is how it works in my case. I don't apply, I'm not on the job boards, so it's hard to tell, but I I would say with Java, uh, you should be fine. This is my, so you know, uh, as it looks right now. And uh, if, you, for instance, uh, take a look at AWS reInvent, the recent one. So AWS, you know, invested a lot in Java right now. So with the, you know, um, implementation of, uh, of um, Crack, Natively in Lambda, which you know helps you with startup performance, and and if you take a look in Asia, they also you know they hired all the Java evangelists. I would say so. Java is like what I see is more like a Java revival. So and um, I so I used JVM for a long time, and if I use JVM, the, the first idea is just to use Java and stick with it, and you know Kotlin will have to be a fifty percent more productive, not ten. Then I would take a look at Kotlin, let's say, or Scala was the same. Wow, I like the Git integration in Visual Studio Code the most. Also, plugins can be defined in workspace file in JSON. Yes, uh, I don't like the um, the uh, the Git integration a bit. I use the command line still in Visual Studio Code, but Visual Studio Code, the Git integration is good, but I don't use it frequently. I use the command line interface for unknown reasons, but um, it is really good. Jeff asked me, friend of the show, regarding an object with nested um, one-to-many when they are stored in database. What is the best way to clone the structure to a new structure and persist it? So the easiest way is Java serialization. It's a not very safe one, because, but um, it, if you know what's in the database, uh, serialize and deserialize, and you, you have the perfect clone. This is the easiest way. Um, and the best way? There is no best way. You know, the, 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 What I told you right now is that a deep copy could be slower, and there's a two-liner, but uh, uh, yeah. This is what uh, you can do. And if you have the object graph already in JSON, then you also have a copy. Um, okay. Um, he asked me, do you use modules, Chixa, in your projects? Not yet, but I'm thinking about in, in one project because I'm doing more and more CLI, command line interfaces, and uh, Ch Chixa could be nice. Um, for all server-side projects, it doesn't matter to me at all. 
Yeah, this is what uh, Alex is. Uh, yeah, no, the uh, or uh, I think the operator was called so Forst uh, Busel. Uh, <laughs> Busel says, okay, uh, Alex is probably talking about the um, operator. I think it was Elvis operator, right? In one programming language, where uh, if null is if it's null, it's not called, but the optional is almost like an Elvis operator in Java. Uh, who can get an example of optionals and map? I didn't get that. Um, okay, so wait a second. We have to proceed. So I didn't actually uh, count it with so many questions. So my suggestion is uh, we go through this very, very, very fast because there are some interesting part, and I will come back to the chat. Um, what would be the proper approach to read network file in J2E environment? This is also this is a classic one, but this is very similar to Alex in Lambda. Exactly the same question. You know, should I read I/O from Lambda or not? And um, so in Java E, no problem. You shouldn't block too too long. The interesting part is in serverless, like Lambda, exactly the same question. You no, know, um, should I block in a Lambda? Should I block in Java E environment? If if not, if if possible, not. So um, you should do this before or after. And in Lambda, um, the same thing. If, if possible, you know, ask uh, EventBridge or whoever to, to provide you the data. And in Lambda, you just process the data. In Java E, uh, it is okay, but you should not block for too long. And if you, you know have to wait, you have to wait what you can do, right? So this one is really interesting. Open extended persistence context in view, a new pattern. I call that back then a gateway pattern. What I did is I had a stateful EJB. And I, and I kept the connections open in JPA. So it means uh, whatever happened to the, to the objects, um, I could commit them at any time and, and write them to the, uh, to the database back. And I liked the pattern, it was stateful, and, but everyone, I got a lot of heat back then. This is stateful, everything has to be stateless. Now the cool story is, if you take a look at Kafka streams and stateful uh, calculations, this is ex exactly this, right? Or a micro-batching. So this is also this. So I would say back then the pattern, there was no name for it. Now we call it, you know, micro-batching or stateful calculations. What it means is that uh, the state is kept by the framework and you can implement averages or whatever and your state changes, but you remember you know, your, your state. And this was like the, the first pure or poor, not pure, poor, so not that good implementation. Um, this was open extended persistence context in a view. I called it the gateway pa pattern, pattern with extended entity manager and stateful EGB. ID generation in clusters, a classic one, right? Uh, how to create IDs. Um, what we use right now is in the UIDs. Back then, the creation of UIDs was slow. Now we re it's actually not a problem anymore. Um, yeah, state uh, calculations, uh, daily limits. This would be a classic Kafka streams or Kinesis data streams, right? Is JSF compatible with Bootstrap? I would say I still like JSF, but I don't like to suggest it because less popular. Um, but you know, for small CRUD applications, nothing wrong with JSF. The problem with JSF, which I really don't like is, if you run in the cloud, JSF is stateful. You could, you, okay, you can run JSF in stateless way, but usually if do nothing, it's stateful. Most stateful, mo most JSF installations are stateful. And then you have to configure the load balancer properly, which is uh, which you have to do. Uh, so, um, how are you going to structure the applications? You know my answer: boundary control entity. No, no difference from seven years ago. So, what I do right now is in my in my projects is um, even monoliths are back, or they were never you know that in my project. So we have even what means huge projects, several hundred classes. This is already big, um, but. Uh, several hundred classes without, you know, mappers and DTOs and DAOs, just, you know, logic. It's, it's already big. And we structure this with a boundary control entity, and it works good. Also a classic one, and still get the question, and I performed a code review recently, and I get exactly the same question. So how to map objects? And I would say mixing storage and transfer consent is an anti-pattern. My answer would be maybe, but what's also an anti-pattern, that the storage and transfer objects are identical. And this is bigger one than this one. So I would say you can absolutely have transfer you know, objects, but they must be different to the storage objects. Otherwise, forget about that. Okay, cool. So at least finished time traveling. This is also finished. And now um, one from a YouTube. So I had a functional interface 
annotation. And um, what I did is I um, someone I implemented something like this. Is by, by the way, my recent short is going to be published in, in a few days. And um, so the question is, why we need the functional annotation? And um, I just thought this is actually funny because it's a really good question. And the answer is we don't need the annotation, so it will still work. So what I can do is I can go here and say app Java, and it will still work. Um, the uh, the why we need the annotation is because if I do something like this, right? So it's perfectly fine for this interface, but we get an error here because now um, the, the lambda has no way to know which method is known. Is it this method or this method? And if I put the annotation here, now I get the error here. And now we see invalid functional interface annotation, which means, okay, we cannot have an, you know, um, a function or a um, functional interface with two methods. So this is like you know fail-fast strategy. With that, I know that it can be only one method here. Okay, and um, that's all. So I just got the question, I think, yesterday on my YouTube channel. So, okay, this is perfect for AHEX-TV. So now I'm done with my questions, and let's see. Yes, we are done, but there are lots of questions. Oh, wow, in the chat. So what's actually here? Twitter is dead or, or, or lazy, and the chat is on fire. So I would suggest, you know, to make this larger. Is it possible? Yes. Ah, uh, the thing with the... With the um, optional map now you can see why i like uh, visual studio code so and, and now i i do air code this is my minimalistic visual studio code now i can say okay what i can do is just create me uh, a java file and now it takes a little bit now the java runtime is up and running and i can now explain you optional so imagine this optional of string uh, message. So, what I can do is I can now return optional of uh, how do you call it? I wish you, I wish, I wish you the best for twenty twenty three. So, so and now I'm calling the method here, and this method uh, should be static. So, static. So now if I call it message, so instead of invoking get, I could say map, and I say, uh, okay, uh, the uh, message here should be I wish or Adam wishes, right? So, and the message. So it's very ad hoc example. So, and now what I get back is uh, optional again, but I can now say, do something. I can filter, for instance, which doesn't make sense a lot, but uh, a lot of sense. But um, here I can say for each, uh, or uh, or just go with that, or else, uh, no wishes, right? And say var message. Uh, message. So now, if I do it again, Java app, Java, I get Adam and whatever. So this is what I meant by the map. So you can you can just you know, do something with map filter as it 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 is almost like a stream, and um, so this is why how you can traverse you know even complex objects um, this way, and the uh, JSON pointer is what I use for JSON in Java. Okay, cool. Hopefully it was helpful. Okay, w where are we? Um, Yes. Uh, oh, simple soap messages. Um, Mr. Kaspar, I don't use soap for 10 years. No idea. Uh, completely, I don't know. Um, 
this is true. Yeah, I think it was Elvis operator, Alex. Look at Elvis operator. I think it's also Elvis operator. Um, yeah, if, if present, you could do if present and not present. There are two present and uh, it's empty and it's if present. Yeah, but this is um, a little bit, you know, um, bloated. What I meant is by map and flat map. You have two options. You can use flat map. Okay, you could do this, Mr. Uh, Faust, but uh, yeah, if you know if your domain logic is complex, absolutely, you can do this. When you're deploying Quarkus app in Docker, how do you determine what memory limit to set in a Docker? You don't have to do it; it's solve problem in Java. There is, uh, if you take a look at uh, at uh, Java memory Docker, there is an option, and Java adjusts to. Uh, let's see. Mr. Beldunk, and the option is, there was a specific Java option. Okay, this is not, this older one. Uh, After um, my last projects were just serverless without Docker. So, but there is an option in Java in Java, where you can say, uh, you know, adjust to the operating system. So in Java knows that uh, you don't get, you know, the uh, memory of the entire host. Java sees the uh, Docker container, uh, Docker container memory. So this is what. So this is. Uh, there's nothing with Quarkus. It just works for all applications. Okay. Pablo doesn't like this. So uh, currently use Java app servers in our team. Pyrotles, this thing should do the job for us. What would be known benefit for switching to micro Quarkus? Uh, Jeff, the only benefit would be uh, memory safe memory savings. So um, I know from one insurance company, so they were on podcasts and they saved a half of a memory just running Quarkus. So this is the only benefit you will get. If you don't have such problems, don't switch. Um, Apache Tomcat is not fully compliant Java server. It is not even entirely. Com I mean, this is not even 10%. It just implements servlets. What is the best way to know the compatibility between JDK and Tomcat version? Jakarta is spec version and Jaxores library version. Uh, I would say if you would like to have a compliant Java server, use Tommy, T-O-M-E-E -E, instead of uh, Tomcat. So you get the entire compatibility. Tommy. Apache Tommy. Okay. Oh, um, this Elvis operator was not Kotlin. The Elvis operator, it was either Ruby, I remember this. I don't know the Elvis operator in Kotlin. It was Ruby, uh, Ruby or uh, uh, or uh, somewhere else. And I think this was null, null, null checks back then. Or Groovy Ruby or something like this back then. I think we are done. It was longer than expected because of your great questions. I would say thank you for watching and uh, see whether I forgot something. No. And uh, see you in February, right? Um, almost, almost spring, right? So um, thank you again. See you next time. Bye.